Thank you, and I'd like to uh, invite uh, our panelists to take the stage as well. I am going to, um, from the podium, um, give you the introduction of this uh, uh, great panel we've got to follow up on that, those uh, pretty, um, pretty inspiring in the sense of the challenges out there and what can be done about them presentations. Um, and then I'm going to join them in, the, uh, in a chair there, and uh, we're going to have a dialogue, I'm hopeful, about the issues that were presented. So let me go from, um, I'll go from your, from right to left and introduce uh, Harry Sia. Harry holds the concurrent posts of Assistant Chief Executive Future Systems and Technology and Chief Engineering and Technology Officer at PUB, Singapore's National Water Agency. He leads PUB's efforts in the continuous exploration, research and development of water technology essential to future-proof PUB's water system. And beside Harry, uh, you, I'll ask you more about that, Harry, how you future, what future proofing means, because um, it's, it sounds like a very bold aspiration. And sitting beside Harry is Professor Kathy Ching Hu. Um, Kathy is the director of the Engin In Engineering Innovation Center, SusTech in Beijing. She is a former board uh, director member at CED Dadi. Um, environmental remediation company, and before that, she was an associate director and chief representative of UK Halcro Group. And beside Kathy is Jonathan Clement. Jonathan is the global technology officer for Nanostone. Jonathan comes to Nanostone from PWN Technologies, where he held the position of chief executive officer. And prior to that, he spent most of his career at Black and Veatch where he led the water treatment business. 2018, Jonathan was named one of the top 25 water leaders in the world by Water World magazine. That's very impressive, Jonathan. And finally, last but not least, Vim Drossart. Uh, Vim is currently CEO of Dunia? Dunea? Dunea. Dunea water utility in the Netherlands. Previously, he served as president of the Europe-Africa region of MWH, headed, headquartered in Colorado, United States. Um, he is passionate about the current and future demands for water and energy, engaging both clients, customers, and staff for mutual success. Um, give our panelists a round of applause. All right, I'm going to join you here, and um, I'm going to just start by saying I, I thought that that presentation um, introduced us to maybe the most uh, sophisticated academic and sophisticated buyer of technology that we could have had on the stage. So in that marketplace, we've got a utility, DC Water, who clearly is deeply engaged in creating innovation within their organization um, and bringing together that cycle of uh, uh, going from the academic into the actual application of new practices. I'm going to ask Vim to start. I'm going to ask him because um, you're in the utility uh, sector. And uh, I'm, my, my question to you is, is that kind of decision-making process the one you go through when you're looking at innovations in your utility? Uh, thank you. Um, also, thank you for the presentation uh, from the both keynote uh, speakers. It was uh, pretty impressive. Uh, you know, from a utility perspective, you need to weigh everything from different sides. Uh, one of the things is that we developed uh, technology to, in my case, to purification uh, for water, but we have done it already for 150 years. So we inv have invested a lot in existing technology. So just rapidly changing it, it's pretty, uh, uh, well, it, it's involving a lot of cost. So you cannot make that decision that quickly, because also, as a public utility, I need to go to the public to explain why I'm doing it. And that's, in make my case, maybe even a big, bigger challenge, because in the Netherlands, people are just assuming it's uh, that usual that you get water out of the tap. So okay. I need to explain it. Let me ask you this, because this, I think, is, is where, where, the, where the rubber meets the road, if you will, in terms of the commercialization of new technology. Somebody has to buy it. And these are complex 
technologies, the, the sale of you know, solving complex problems. You're describing how you need to go and consult with the public about it. You've got 150 years of infrastructure. Who else do you talk to in that process in order to make this decision? And do you have the resources you need to do it? I think, uh, yes, we need to collaborate with universities. We need uh, people from this audience. We need IWA in this. So we need a lot of uh, uh, help in making it. Uh, but also we have, of course, our people ourselves uh, involved in it. So but can I go to you, Harry? OK. Because I, I think in some, I, I feel like PUB, in my mind, is a lot more like DC water um, in terms of the amount of capacity you have within PUB to do your own research, to evaluate technology, to, to take risks with respect to the implementation, implementation of new technology. Um, how, how did you succeed in building that kind of capability? What's the driver for that in, in PUB? Uh, I think first thing first is that I think in a way, we in PUB, we must be in a way be technically strong. That means understanding our operation, understanding our planning, our design. Then while saying that, so with all this knowledge and experience in, then in the end, any new ideas or technology that maybe in the audience, companies, uh, universities, whatever it is, that means I say current. Eh? So basically what we do is that we benchmark against our current, what we are doing. Is this idea has the potential to make it better than our, our current processes? If the answer is yes, then where are the gaps? Then from the gaps, then that's, where, that's the research question. In a way, to stay relevant, so that in the end, is a solution, is a problem looking for a solution, then the solution looking for a problem. Now, while saying this, today's current technology only buy us time. Because if you are appreciating about climate change and everything, where the, the need to utilize your resources efficiently and well, you need to look for new solutions. That's where, in a way, what we will do is that we need to look long term. So we do uh, do R&D in terms of uh, long term. Some of the f fundamental research, we fund it. We go back to nature to look for a new solution and prepare the journey maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Because uh, I think those who come to Singapore, because our driver in Singapore is different. We are very, uh, what I call it, um, we are nothing. We are no resources. So basically, we take in everything. So it's, it's, to our, it's to our interest to ensure that everything that we use is used well at a minimum. So Harry, let me follow up because I see a, th there's an interesting uh, dynamic you're creating here because I, I'm not sure the Netherlands is, um, uh, if, if, if Singapore is, is uh, nothing, um, the, the, the Netherlands is, um, I, I won't even finish the sentence. We didn't drown. Uh, <laughs> it almost was nothing. Um, but do you have this, so Vim has talked about the, the, the business of raising rates and going back to the public and getting, explaining why we're fooling around with something that's worked perfectly for 150 years. Is, do you have this same issue with sort of the public acceptance of, of the investments you're making and the, the long-term vision you have? Well, I think basically is that I think the public trust in us is high. As a utility, we have to ensure that the water we supply and, and the people drink is safe, not only for household, but for the, for the, for the industries. Industry also is a customer. So they have a certain water quality needs. They may be, sometimes may even be more stringent than for drinking. So basically understanding your customer needs. So in the end, bottom line, everything that we do, it cannot even it may, may be the most efficient. If the water quality or safety is compromised, we will not go for it. Kathy, can I um, pose this question in the context of what you're doing in China? Do you see yourself as more like um, Harry in terms of the vision and investment in engineering and research and academic uh, uh, research in developing innovation? Or are you more in kind of Vim's dilemma of, uh, I have a hard time getting people to agree to make the kinds of investments I think I'd like to make. 
Thanks, Paul. Um, I think I totally have a different uh, opinion because I'm working in the innovation center, and now we sort of like work to the different uh, direction because uh, now the, the whole world is changing. It's not like before. We always, uh, you know, doing the end of the treatment, you know, all the waste. We could change it to the front. And the innovation center, which is we cooperated with uh, some other field like IBM, you never think you're going to cooperate with them. We cooperated <laughs> with, uh, uh, you know, I, Apple or you know all these different uh, industry. And uh, what they required, they required if we could uh, sort of like uh, provide more efficient, and uh, also we provide uh, sort of like a low cost. Uh, you know, this all kind of a process. So we think, you know, from uh, my opinion, I think IW, you know, IWA is a very good uh, platform which could uh, get in all different uh, perspective, different field, people work together. And uh, they can solve the problem from the front, not always in the end. Uh, you know, as you're talking about China, because you can see the air pollution used to be, you know, a couple of years ago. You can see the end of the treatment, you know, is useless. You cannot control anymore about the, you know, the air pollution. So you need to go back to the front. So how you reduce, even doing the, the circular economy, uh, sustainable economy, that can be the possible now because you all work together from different. Are you and you um, optimistic about that, the ability for that point of view to migrate across China and change the way? Uh, basic uh, engineering practices. Yeah, I, I quite, uh, you know, so sort I'm of confident, you know, for like a nano nano process and uh, graphy now all become to the possible, and this can be used in the environmental field. It's no problem at all. Okay, well, Jonathan, um, I, microphone. yeah, you got two microphones <coughs> because you have so much to yeah. say. Um, <laughs> Jonathan, Not really. I, I see you. I see you as um, having had experience in a lot of different aspects uh, of this, and not the least of which is in, in the sort of entrepreneurial uh, uh, aspect of it as well. You gave me a strange look there when I was saying something. Um, yeah. what, what were you thinking? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about why we're all here, and one of the the tasks. As how IWA adapts to innovation and how IWA can serve innovation. And I think it's all about learning and it's about education because I did something for the Asian Development Bank a few years ago and what I realized that people were very unknowledgeable about what's going on with water technology. Uh, Harry and I had an earlier conversation about MBRs. People don't understand a lot of the new technologies today and the biggest role that we have to worry about everyone on this stage and everyone that's out there has to worry about education and education is the key. It's knowledge. It's listening and as Socrates said, I'm ignorant and I have to learn. So I don't want to talk too much. I want to listen. <laughs> okay, well, let, let's come back. Let, we, are very, we have a very limited amount of time. So have you raised this both. Um, Kathy and Jonathan have raised this issue of what can IWA do to, to, to accelerate this process. Maybe we all feel that when we look at other sectors in the economy, the, 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 the rate of change and adoption of new technologies exceeds what we're doing in the water sector dramatically. So what could IWA do to make this happen faster in our sector. I'm going to repeat myself. Education. Do you think that's it? But is that if, educated, if uh, after being, education, being knowledgeable is very good. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm buying this, but are there are other things that need to happen. I would like to add something to it. It's education, of course, but also sharing knowledge. And I think sometimes, especially in the commercial side, eh, we are protecting our IP. And if we start protecting the IP and not sharing it, we will never make the steps that we need to make. Yeah, I, I would like to add that education could lead into the, you know, thinking, changes thinking, you know, the thinking from internet way, from big data way, so you could see the different world. And Harry, do you want to add to that? Uh, I think uh, I do, IWA itself has a very important role to play. I think the key is actually discussing right facts and figures. I think a lot of times, uh, I mean, I attend conferences. Uh, so sometimes, in a way, I couldn't, from the paper, I couldn't get any uh, learning points from it. 
because it lacks many information. Maybe IWA can do is to try to, in a way, to improve the, in terms of protocols, in terms of quality of paper. Uh, for example, like if I talk about water reuse, which is my favorite topic, <laughs> right? Maybe as a, standard, as, a, as a standard requirement, show me your processes. Instead of use loose terms like tertiary tutor effluence, which can mean just a simple sand filter to can be an MF filtered, it can be RO water. So it's used loosely, this one. And two is the, in, I learned from the operation point of view, is the water quality data, the quality data. QAQC is very important because I learned a hard way when I was not smart enough or disciplined enough to look at QAQC. I was spending weeks and weeks trying to troubleshoot a problem when I'm going off tension until I questioned the data and realized that my sampling was wrong, whatever I'm doing is wrong. So maybe come up with a certain protocol. When you talk about water quality, you state the water quality, you state the parameter, you state the protocol that you used. So you need to create some discipline in terms of the technical uh, presentation. Then whether I'm in Singapore, or whether in Africa, or US, or where am I, I understand how you get the, the, the information. I think that's very important. And can I ask you one, one last question? Do I have time for one last question, Robert? Yes. Um, the, uh, w as we look to creating sort of closed loop systems, like the closed loop <laughs> system you have in Singapore, does, is this a disruptive kind of new design objective that, that creates opportunities to rethink um, how we use technology or how we apply technology? Is it a moment where, um, where new changes kind of inspired by these new objectives and goals that many utilities have. Jonathan says, no, I don't think so. No, 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 I, I don't quite try to understand your question, but I think, um, I'm thinking about the Netherlands and I'm thinking about Singapore. These are very small countries which have very high population and they have to deal with these things. The problem is, is that innovation is, is many times forced by a crisis. If there's a problem, we deal with it. And that's the problem in this industry, is that we don't deal with something until we have to, rather than be more forward thinking. Any other comments on this? I was, I was, it came to me when I was listening to Sidir talk about a wastewater plant and really solving wastewater treatment problems very elegantly. If this was the front end of a water treatment plant, would this be different? And, and would, would that, Create, of course, it would be different, but does that create a, a sort of change in the industry that could be a... Maybe I can add a little bit to it, uh, because I agree also what Jonathan was saying, uh, but I also would emphasize that we should not think too small, we should think big, and I think also we should be uh, uh, careful not to stay in the water bubble, if I may say so. <laughs> so let's think about different sectors, let's see how we can learn from them, for example, the digitalization is going so fast that will have a bigger influence on our whole industry than closing the loop between uh, uh, the water cycle. So let's open, uh, also for maybe for IWA, let's open, uh, open to this. Kathy, do you want to add anything? Yes, talking about the good quality of data, you know, I think Harry is right, you know, very difficult. But if you use a big data, big data is not means a big amount. It's from different uh, variety. So you can cross, uh, you, know, you know, prove your data is wrong or not. For example, when we're doing something, we use satellite data, we use energy data, even transportation data, all can, you know, cross, uh, so sort of like, uh, prove what you got, and you find the trend is very beautiful. Just want to add it up. Okay, I think, uh, I, I think our time is up, um, although I feel like we could uh, carry on this conversation for a long time. Um, I, I w could everybody please give a, a nice round of applause and appreciation for our <laughs> panelists. I, I want to, um, this, this topic is a theme for the entire day. I want to just uh, invite anybody who is kind of interested in continuing to engage in this discussion to go to room 101 where you can um, follow a full day-long track on this topic of innovation and programming in. And um, with that, I uh, again thank you all for your attention and um, close the meeting. Thank you.